Hey guys, how you doing today? Um, I'm back for another Vinyl Finds video. Uh, today is, I guess, mainly uh, online purchases either uh, through Amazon or uh, Discogs. There might be a couple of record store ones in there as well, but uh, mainly online. Uh, so got quite a few, so I won't be saying a lot about, uh, about each one. So let's get going. Um, the first one, Ween White Pepper. I've been really into Ween lately. I've, I've mainly had Ween on, um, on CD, but uh, lately I started getting some of their albums on uh, vinyl, and this is their album from the year 2000. Um, the name is taken. Ween, even though they don't sound a lot like the Beatles, the, there is some Beatles influence, and especially on this album, the name is taken by combining the White Album and Sgt. Pepper, hence White Pepper. This is probably Ween's most accessible album and uh, a lot of melodic stuff on here. So probably their most Beatles sounding album. But um, if you're going into this expecting the Beatles, then, you know, I, I don't know if that's accurate. But certainly they uh, are very melodic. And, and if you're going to get one Ween album, um, this might be the easiest one to get into. And then the album that followed White Pepper is the album Quebec, named after uh, one of the provinces here in Canada. So this was from 2003, a much heavier album than, than White Pepper. Um, still very Ween-like, a lot of humor still in this album. Ween are a bit of a, an acquired taste. Um, I think either you love Ween or you don't like Ween is, is kind of the, the two extremes. Uh, I really like them, and this is a this is a great Ween album from 2003. This is Stereo Lab, and it's a compilation called Switched On Volume One. Um, I don't have a lot of Stereo Lab, and what I have is mainly on CD. But this is a compilation that. Uh, gathers together their first two EPs, uh, two four-song EPs, and then also uh, both sides of a single. So there's 10 tracks in total. Um, it's their first um, it, it's their first releases, so their very first two EPs and their, and their first single. This, this is material that was out even before um, Stereo Lab's first album, Peng, I think it was called. And uh, for some weird reason the cover of this switched on comp is almost identical to the Peng first album cover as well. For those of you that like XTC we have the Dukes of Stratosphere uh, and their EP 25 o'clock so this is a six song uh, EP by I guess the three uh, then members of, uh, of XTC. Um, you know, XTC, especially in the later years, I think always had sort of a psychedelic uh, tinge to their sound, but this is heavily, heavily psychedelic, as you could probably tell by the, uh, the cover. Excellent stuff. We then have Rory Gallagher's band Taste, and this is a compilation called Moving On. It basically gathers together the best tracks from the first two taste LPs back from the um, back from the 60s. So this is your you know typical blues rock kind of stuff. And if you like Rory Gallagher's solo stuff, then this is this is very similar sounding. And then a blues album from, I believe, 1989, we have John Lee Hooker, The Healer. Uh, this was quite a successful album for John Lee Hooker. Um, it gathers um, a lot of guests together with him on this album, uh, namely Carlos Santana, Bonnie Raitt, uh, George Thorogood, people like that, Robert Cray. Um, the only guest vocals on here come from Bonnie Raitt, which, uh, which are an excellent duet between her and John Lee Hooker. Uh, the song The Healer, the title track, uh, was, um, I think, 
played quite a bit around this time. So this is a good uh, a good blues album. It doesn't suffer from those albums where you know you get a lot of guests, kind of like Carlos Santana. I mean, the Supernatural I thought was a good album, but after that he made too many albums with a lot of guest vocals, and it really. Um, there wasn't a nice sort of album feel to, to those albums, right? So this here, because a lot of the guests are um, instrumentalists, I think it works really well uh, with John Lee Hooker, and it's a nice, uh, consistent sound across the album. And then an album from 1980. Uh, this is called James Brown Jam 1980s. And it's, uh, it's exactly uh, what, what the title suggests. It's uh, sort of extended uh, funk uh, jams uh, with some vocals. Really, not really the sort of verse chorus, uh, verse chorus type of song structure. It's just sort of long jams with James just sort of ad-libbing many times over, over the tracks. But still really, really good. I, I, I really dig this stuff. Then we have an EP from the band Ride. This is called Tomorrow Shore. Uh, four song EP which came out after their um, reunion album of, uh, of a few years ago called Weather Diaries. Um, I never got that album for some weird reason. I mean, I, I, I like Ride, but I heard the tracks and I thought it was okay. I, I seem to like the songs on this EP more than that, uh, that album, so uh, I ended up getting this. And none of these four songs are on that uh, Weather Diaries album. And then we have Donovan, and this is called Barba Jago, I think is how you pronounce the title. Um, this is another one of Donovan's 60s albums, and it's very typical 60s uh, Donovan stuff. Not as good as uh, Sunshine Superman or Mellow Yellow or some of those other well-known albums, but it's, you know, you know what you're getting with... Uh, with Donovan with this sort of psychedelic folk kind of stuff. And then another psych classic, we have Country Joe and the Fish. Uh, what's this called? <laughs> Electric Music for the Mind and Body. So I think most of you guys know this. I, I kind of gave up uh, trying to find this out in the wild and, and bought this uh, reissued copy, which wasn't uh, too expensive. Uh, and then another psychedelic classic, we have The Pretty Things with SF Sorrow, their, their concept album. And I guess this comes in sort of a, I think it's called gra a graveyard uh, cover, sort of the shape of a tombstone or, or, or whatever. Uh, so I think you guys should, should probably know this, uh, this album. I've had uh, this on... Uh, I had the, the album SF Sorrow on a, a compilation CD which included some live versions of some of the material which was from uh, I guess a more recent reunion so it kind of combined um, the original, uh, some original songs from the album back in the in late 60s with some of the new live versions and it kind of felt like I wanted to get the, uh, the album proper so, so I ended up getting this and there's the pretty things on the back there. And then an album that I've actually wanted for quite a long time, we have the Bee Gees First. Uh, this is probably, in my opinion, the Bee Gees' best album. Um, I've been looking for this for, for quite a while. I, I had ordered it before one time with uh, an order that never did arrive, so I got refunded with that, and then I found another fairly clean, uh, clean copy. I mean, if you don't know the Bee Gees' uh, 60s stuff, and all you know is that sort of 70s Saturday Night Fever type stuff. Um, you need to kind of abandon your thoughts on that 70s stuff, which, you know, I, some people like. That, and that's cool. I, I like some of it as well. But uh, this is the real Bee Gees, in my opinion. And if you're going to start out somewhere, this, this would be the album to start out with. Pink Floyd, Re Pink Floyd Relics. Uh, so this is an early Pink Floyd comp. Um, it includes some of the Sid Barrett years. Um, a lot, a lot of stuff on here with Sid. So if, if all you know is um, Piper at the Gates of Dawn, this is a, a worthy uh, acquisition to get some more of the Sid uh, Sid stuff.
We have Miles Davis, Live Evil. This is, uh, I believe, the follow-up to Bitches Brew. So if you're into Bitches Brew, um, you should like this. This combines, even though the title is Live Evil, um, it combines live material and some studio material. The live material are the more lengthier pieces. We're talking 10 plus minutes here. And the studio stuff is the shorter, um, you know, couple, you know, two, three minute type songs on here. But uh, again, if you, if you like Bitches Brew era miles, then this is definitely worth picking up. And the cover art is just spectacular. Captain Beefheart, the Spotlight Kid. So I, I did not own any Captain Beefheart uh, until a f several months ago. And then I started off with Safe as Milk, and I also got one of his uh, latter albums, his second last album, Dock at the Radar Station. And then I, I, um, I saw on YouTube there's some live uh, German sessions that he did that had some songs from the Spotlight Kid. And I read, read up a bit on this album that this is one of Beefheart's most uh, accessible albums, I guess. Um, so, you know, Trout, Trout Mask Replica, I think, is a classic, but is it's not the place to start for sort of newbie uh, Beefheart uh, fans. Um, the Spotlight Kid, I think, is a, a fairly accessible album. And then we have a 2-4 album from the Steve Miller Band. This is uh, combines the two albums... Children of the Future and Sailor, which I believe are his first two albums. And this is much different Steve Miller to the Joker um, type of Steve Miller of the, of the early to mid 70s. This is definitely more psychedelic based uh, music. So if, if all you know is the Joker, Steve Miller, um, I think you should ch check out these uh, these two albums, uh, Children of the Future and, and Sailor. And last, we have 10 Years After, Cricklewood Green. I've got a few 10 Years After in my collection that I've shown in past videos, and uh, I've wanted this one for, for quite a while. Um, this is going back to the 60s and probably one of their uh, their be their best you know sort of in that blues rock vein uh, but I think the songs on this particular album are probably better than some of the other uh, 10 years after Kirkwood Green okay guys thanks a lot for watching and we'll see you next time